Hey guys, welcome back to this video. I want to discuss uh, a little bit of a controversy. Uh, people are going to have different opinions and that's okay, but I think it's important that we approach this topic with a clear and open mind and that we have some open dialogue on this. And, uh, you know, if, if I offend anybody, I want to apologize ahead of time. My whole intent is to help the Bujinkan. My whole intent is to provide constructive uh, uh, constructive comments, constructive inputs from my perspective and my views. If you don't agree with it, that's perfectly okay. If you have completely different views or understandings or you don't agree with me or, or whatever, that is absolutely okay. I'm not going to sit here and try to say I know better. But I want to talk about what is considered good taijutsu? What is considered quality? What is considered... Um, uh, you know, again, what is just what is considered good taijutsu? We have all these people out here who are teaching what they believe to be the the what they believe to be good taijutsu. They they put out all of these different videos. Um, they they hold these seminars. They do these workshops. They, you know, they go to Japan. They they train with their teachers and they come back and they share. And so there's all this information that's out there, but it all looks so different different people doing different things. And everybody is, uh, and I don't want to say everybody blanketly, but I mean, I think the majority of people believe in what they do and they believe that what they're doing is correct. But what does that mean? So I want to break that down a little bit and just talk about that. Um, if you're not subscribed to my channel, please do so. I, I want to have this channel as a as an outlet to bring up topics that we can talk about. There's a lot of really great videos out there that, you know, show fantastic techniques and, and educate you on, on the Bujinkan and stuff. But I want to talk about different stuff, things that don't normally get talked about. Uh, and so that's kind of what my channel is for. So please help support the channel and, and subscribe to it, like the videos and share them. I appreciate everything that all the support I've gotten so far. Um, so let's dive right in. So what is considered good Taijutsu? Okay. People will talk about Taijutsu as being all kinds of different things. They'll talk about timing, angling, distancing. They'll talk about the Kihon. They'll talk about uh, who your teacher is and that line of transmission. And, and all these things are important, of course. Um, some people will talk about <clears throat> your your uh, your knowledge of things, you know, things like anatomy or even the Ruha themselves or or specific techniques. You know, this technique has to be done this way. This is what this is how it's supposed to be done. Or and then you get people that say we have to modernize what we do in order to make it effective or to make it good that we can't move like we're in 1500s, 1400s Japan. We're not wearing armor and carrying swords and you have all these different ideas and, and, you know, whether or not it's applicable to the street and, and it's just all these different ideas. So what is considered good? So in my opinion, what is determinant on the quality has to do with a couple of different factors. There's two. And unfortunately, I think, I think that that sometimes it's easy to to miss the duality of the two, the connection between the two, and focus too much on one. And those the duality of that, or those two things, are that it has to it has to have a purpose, a specific result, but the process of achieving that result also has to be perfected. So let me give you an example. People take a look at at something that we do in the Bujinkan. And they go, oh, that would never work, or that doesn't work. And so they don't understand the process of it is developing something. There's a specific reason why that process of doing that technique was established in the first place. So all they're looking at is the end result. They see the end result and they say, oh, well, that's not going to work. If the guy applies resistance, look, it's not going to work. You can't step into an MMA gym and, gym and apply that into, in the ring. You know, if they're looking at the result, and that's results-oriented thinking, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's a reason that the results are still there. The, I'm sorry, there's a reason the process was, was created. And so when there's a, too much of an emphasis on one or the other, I think that's where things start, the quality starts to become a problem. And in my opinion, again, 
What is determinant on quality is that not only is it going to work, but is it sustainable? And this is the part I think that's important. So we can take a basic key on a basic technique and we can apply it under pressure and then realize that things aren't going to work right. So we need to adapt it. We need to change it. And so we start making these changes and everything. And so we start changing the process. And in so doing, we become ignorant of any possibilities that we may be setting us up ourselves up for something that's not sustainable. Um, so yeah, okay, you can finally apply this technique, but in the long run, it's limited by maybe your, maybe your strength, maybe you're more athletic and you're stronger. So it's easier for you to apply the technique using your athleticism. But later when you become older, or if you're injured or you're weak, or the person outsizes you and is more of an athlete, you're going to run into problems with that. Um, or maybe, uh, you know, you're doing damage to your body. This is actually something that's really interesting. In my class, I put a big emphasis on the lower body, the way the legs are used, the, the knees, the ankles, the alignment of the feet. And so I do that for a reason because I've been training in martial arts a very long time in a lot of different martial arts. And I have friends in all kinds of different arts. And it's interesting that guys that end up in my, I'm in my fifties, but guys that are in their forties and things like that, they have knee problems, they have back problems, they have all this wear and tear on their body from all the hard training they did, where it was all about competitive winning. It was all about just getting that result and they wear and tear on their bodies. And now here in their later part of their life, they have mobility issues, they have health issues. They're not living fully functional people. But I look at the seniors that are in Japan and it's, I mean, Hatsumi Soke, he's in his eighties. And, and I look at these guys and they're amazing. Um, because the process was followed. They followed a process that was sustainable over time, that it actually made them healthier over time. And and, I, and again, I'm not trying to ridicule, if, if you're in sports or you're doing things that require you to have fast skill sets, I get it. There are occupations, you don't have time to spend 10 years to get good at something. You gotta get it now because you gotta go, you have to apply this in your real life. And so you can, unfortunately, you might have to sacrifice some of that sustainability to get you some base skills right away. Totally understand that. At the same time, they'll understand that you need to continue focusing on that correct process so that you can lose the reliance on some of that that you needed to do so that it becomes sustainable over time and develops over time to be efficient and not limited. Um, but that's, a, that's a, a, an example of that. There's another example of uh, a friend of mine who's a very, very long time, very skilled, very talented karate guy. And, and he actually went out and made this, this great argument about why it's important to train in the old forms very correctly. And he cited a perfect example of somebody who didn't focus on that and he started teaching kids classes based on his competitive sport karate. And what happened was, is later on, some of these kids ended up with permanent knee damage because the way the knee was articulating was not sustainable. It was, it was actually a very, um, it was very dangerous the way that he was having to move their knee. But that's what he did when he was competing. And so he taught that to those kids. And some of those kids ended up with sports injuries that they later attributed to improper, uh, constant micro tear, constant stress to the knees caused by this improper way of training. So my point on all of that is, is that there is a purpose for everything. Now I wanna flip this, let's flip this. Let's take a look at people who are just process oriented. Learning a process is very difficult, especially in our Bujinkan arts, because unless you have uh, your master teacher, this person that knows these fundamentals to the deepest levels with you all the time, this constant correction and stuff, it, you're not going to know all of this. You're not going to understand this or even see it in your own movement. And so you're the process that you're repeating could be missing something very significant. And so you're repeating this process and because of that, your end result will suffer. So <clears throat> Take, for example, a Kihon Kata and how, um, you know, you learn this, this particular Kihon a certain way, Kihon Kata, a certain way. And 
maybe at the time when you learned it, it was designed to teach you a, a certain point or a certain thing, but they didn't go deep into some of the deeper things about it, but you were just kind of taught a really kind of watered down form of that. But when you go to apply it under resistance, it fails. And then you're like, well, what the heck? So now you have a decision to make. You can either modify the way you're currently doing it to try to put a Band-Aid over it to make it work, that's solution-oriented, or you can dive deeper into the process of it to say, obviously I'm missing something or I'm not doing something correct and focus on the process of how you are doing it so that the end result works the way it's supposed to or the way that it was originally designed. And this is the part that a lot of people struggle with because we're in a short uh, attention span society. We're in, a, um, we're in a quick results type of mindset. We want to push a button and have that result. We want to be able to use an app and order it and have it on our doorstep. We want to be able to upload information and have it available right now. That the process as it was done in these old arts was meant to take a while. Unless you're training people to go fight a war in a month, um, where they didn't care about your long-term health, uh, this, this path of, of development was designed to take a while. So the process is a constant process of refinement and improvement and digging and, and working on things. And this is where a lot of people don't have patience for this type of training. They don't, they don't, have, the, they don't have the mental focus for it. They want to move on. They want to jump. This technique, this technique, this technique. Let's do all 15 kata from the Schrodinger or whatever, like they, they want to just blow through all these things like they're speed bumps instead of really dissecting each one and looking at how those actually work. What is the process for that? Because everything we do has levels of development for reason. In teaching, they have a term called scaffolding. And if you ever look at a building, how it's under construction, you'll see scaffolding, you'll see, uh, you will see platforms that are built on top of platforms and everything is built on it. And it's through this that, that they can work higher, higher up on this building to build this, to build this tower, but everything is built on the preceding thing. So the process of learning the process itself functions the same way. You have to first start with the bottom, the ground, and then you have to, once that's solid enough to be able to hold the next level, then the next level can be done, and then so on and so forth. And in other videos, I talk about what is Kihon, Kiso, and you know, building blocks, foundation, and your castle, and all this kind of stuff. You can go back and find that. But I think you understand what I'm trying to say, is that this idea of process building takes a lot of mindful training, a lot of patient training, a lot of oftentimes very boring training. Um, but again, what is boring? Boring just means that your mind is seeking to be entertained. So and this kind of cuts into kind of my, my other side to this that I don't want to necessarily get too far into in this video, but we have to be honest about why we're training and why is it we're training? Are we training to be good? And what does that mean? Does good mean to be entertaining? Because there's a lot of people out there who are very entertaining, but is it good? What does that mean? So I can be entertained by somebody, but all they're really doing is dancing. It's, it, it, what does that really mean? What is good? So, and I know I'm kind of jumping around, but I, I really think, I really think that um, if you understand what I'm trying to say, I think you'll get my point that we self-assess ourselves based on the opinions of others. This is a very, very common psychological problem with me. We base our quality on what somebody else determines to be our quality. And martial arts are a perfect environment where that happens because when Sensei shows a kata or a technique and, and then he says, okay, go. And then we, we're practicing the technique. Be honest, how much of your awareness is focused on what is what Sensei is looking at? Is Sensei looking at me? What does he think? If you, if you notice that the teacher is looking at you, are you suddenly distracted now by what they might be thinking? So, and, and that's okay. You're looking for guidance and coaching and stuff, but <clears throat> how many people out there are unwilling to allow themselves to make mistakes? How many people out there, and, and I'm speaking to those of you that have been in this art a long time, you have some rank, people recognize you, you're in the room and they know that you're, 
you know, you're the grand poobah, you're the, you know, you have this certain, certain title or certain recognition that are you, how do you feel when you're first shown something and then you now have to perform it in a training atmosphere where you're more than likely going to screw it all up? How does that make you feel? So <clears throat> these are things that are really important in the development because oftentimes we can become trapped by our own uh, expectations we put on ourselves about what is considered good and do we want people to place that value on us. In my opinion, I think that there's two sides to that. I think obviously we want the approval of our senpai and our seniors and stuff. Um, that if they think we're doing well, we want to know that. And that's perfectly okay, because how do we know? You, you know, we need that feedback. It's important. If we're not doing something right, we definitely need that feedback too. Um, but we also need to feel good about what we're doing. So we need that, sorry, we need that self-analysis and that self-approval at the same time that I think it could go bad where if we always say, oh, we suck, my pudgets sucks. And you, this false humility that people can have, and I know I've been guilty of it too, that to me is just a hindrance to growth. If you do something that works well and you followed the process and your teacher said, oh, you did that very well, now maybe just turn your foot a little bit more and you'll do it better, that is such a magically good feeling. I mean, it's that that to me is good. If you want to know what good taijutsu is, this is what sums it up for me right here. Good taijutsu is... I did it the way I was taught or the way that I understood. I did it that way. I got a result that that satisfied me. But at the same time, I also know where I'm going to make it better or how I'm going to make it better. When you're in that state of, of, of feeling good about what you're doing, but also feeling good about where you need to go, knowing clearly what you need to work on, that to me is good taijutsu. It's not about whether or not it works because as far as like, can I survive in a fight? Because here's the reality. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and boast about my background, but let me just say I have occupations and life experiences that I've experienced success and failure in fighting and combat in, in real, real fighting. And fortunately, I'm still here breathing, um, but I have battle scars. I have stuff. And there's, I'm sure there's people out there. Maybe this is you too. You have those experiences that there are so many factors that go into what works and what doesn't work in a real life environment. Everything from your how you feel in that moment, your mindset, um, whether or not you've had a drink or two, whether or not the other guy is hyped up on stuff. Is there multiple people? Are you even aware that there's multiple people? How's the weather? What kind of, a, what kind of terrain are you on? All of these other factors. And then just pure luck. Sometimes you can be the best fighter in the room and bad luck strikes and you're done. It's just, so you can't just say good taijutsu is what's going to work because there's something that there's a, there's a, a gentleman and I'm going to throw his name out here, Rory Miller. I, I like to read his works, his books. He's an interesting guy. He's a very introspective guy and he's done a lot of excellent work and, and just talking about martial arts and reality of fighting and stuff. And he's got a very real combat background. Um, but I like reading his meditations and things he talks about. But one of the things that that he mentioned in, in one of his writings, and I apologize, I can't remember where I read it, but it was one of the things he mentioned. He said that, and I'm going to badly paraphrase, that martial arts training, martial techniques, training and techniques and stuff, we're only talking about mitigating percentages. We're talking about small percentages that you're affecting because again, he recognizes that there's so many other factors that go into what is considered effective or what's considered um, success in combat. There's so many other things that come into play. So <clears throat> when you're training, if all you're doing is focusing on the quality of it being whether or not, uh, whether or not it worked, so it must be good, then you're discounting all the other factors that played into that, number one. And number two, you're also becoming um, disassociated with the correct process for that long-term development that's going to keep you living happy, healthy, and fully functional in your later years. That 
if you go into fighting and you try to apply, uh, let's say Onikadaki, right? And and you try to apply that, and you get the guy's wrist, and you get this hand underneath there, and you try to do all that, and then you're just like tucking all underneath that and trying to do all this, that you're using all your size and strength, and it worked, right? It worked. Boom. Great. Now you're thinking, okay, this worked, so I'm going to teach it. I'm going to practice it this way because I know it worked. But what you're not realizing is the reason it worked is because you outsized the person. So later on, when maybe the guy's bigger or maybe you're weaker from age, health, whatever, you try to apply it in that same way and it fails miserably and you die. So I, I want to be very clear here that I'm not judging how anybody trains. I just want people to understand that there has to be a healthy respect for not just what works, but the process of development that has been laid out for literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years by many, many people who have lived and died according to these teachings and have applied it in situations that I guarantee none of us have experienced the magnitude of warring that these people have, you know, went through over these hundreds and hundreds of years that these techniques were born from all of that. This knowledge was born from all of that. There's a reason that process is put into place. And the right teachers who understand that teach that way, and oftentimes they're not the most popular because people are not entertained by that. They want the big flash. They want the big finish. They want the big result. So I think it's a good time right now for us to, as a community to maybe step back and look at these things, look at what we're doing. Maybe stop being so much martial scholars and spend a little more time being martial artists. I hope I am not offending anybody, please, please. But what I'm trying to say here is, is that, um, you know, we've been on this journey a long time, the Bujinkan as a community. We've been on this journey a long time and this Bujinkan community has changed so much. The way we change has changed so much. Atsumi Soke has, done so many incredible things with this art. And now we have Hatsumi Soke essentially in retirement. And now we have this new generation of Soke and some of them are staying quiet. Some of them are sharing a little bit more. We got certain ones, uh, Ishizuka Soke, Daishion Soke, um, who's coming out and sharing some good stuff. There's a lot of just really good uh, things that are coming out. But I think I think it's an interesting trend that's happening now that 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 it gives us an opportunity to maybe take some steps. We're coming off over a year of, of, of this pandemic where people haven't been able to train or they've been having to train solo. I think now is a great time for us to, to really kind of reset ourselves. Who cares what anybody else is doing? Don't focus on what other people are doing. Let's take a look at ourselves and reset ourselves because at the end of the day, your martial path is about you and yourself. It's not about whether or not you have thousand students or you know you 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 produce a million videos and you got a million books and you have all these different whatevers and you have this great plaque on the wall that says you're this and that uh -uh. at the end of the day you're born alone and you die alone and on the martial path you are on your own path and now now we have an opportunity that we can really take a sober look at what it is we what has got us up to this point what do we need to do to move forward? But not just to move forward, what is it we really want? And be honest about what it is we really want. Do we want good kaijutsu? Okay, great. But what does that mean? So I think, I, I really think that, um, that now is a good time. And I really hope that as a community, we can approach that. Instead of pointing fingers at everybody, maybe we need to do some of this a little more and less of this. There's an old saying that a uh, pastor friend of mine, a long, long time ago, he used to always say, every time you point your finger at somebody, you always have three pointing back at you. So maybe we need to stop focusing on what other people are doing and just take an honest look at ourselves and, and, and determine, is this really number one? Is it sustainable, what we're doing? And number two, is it gonna actually produce the results that it's designed to? If the result we're following is, or I'm sorry, is the, if the process that we're following is not producing the result that we want, then maybe we need to look at this process 
And instead of discarding everything, if, if we know this process is how we're taught, then maybe we need to realize there's gaps in our, in our understanding of this process, or maybe we need a little more work in some of this process. But to discard that process and go with something completely different um, is, in my opinion, you're, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, or, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of missing something. You're, you're doing something completely that's you. And if that's what you want to do, then be honest with it and actually say, this is my thing. This is what I want to teach based on my experience and knowledge. Um, but this is not based on this. This is not Bujin Khan. This is based on this. And I think if we give, if, if people are a little bit more honest about what they do, because there are a lot of really cool training out there. People have all kinds of different knowledge and they want to share all their different knowledge. And that's okay. Just be honest about where that knowledge comes from so people can make decisions for themselves. But again, if the process is good and the results match the expectation of that process, that, in my opinion, is good Tajitsu, regardless of the source. Regardless of the source. Now, if it's Bujinkan Buddha Tajitsu, then you know that source has to be part of the Bujinkan background, which is the Ruha, Soke, the Daishihan, you know, the, the, the new Soke, that sort of stuff. It has to come from that source. Tajitsu is Tajitsu. Tajitsu is body mechanics, body art, you know, that sort of thing. All martial arts have Tajitsu. So you can make that argument. This is good Tajitsu because it's Katori uh, Shito Ryu or something else. Um, it's good Tajitsu because it fits their methodology and achieves the result that their art is designed for, whereas Bujinkan has its own methodology producing its own result. And that in itself should be explored. So, Sorry, this went on a little longer than I wanted, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say. I hope this shed some light. I hope this helped you. Um, please drop me some comments. Let me know what you think. It's okay if you disagree. I just want to create some dialogue and get people thinking and talking about this stuff uh, instead of everybody just kind of mindlessly like drones and robots following the same pattern, same without actually having sort of critical thinking skills and, and, and also being honest about what they want and what they're looking for and whether or not their current approach is achieving that. So again, thank you so much. And uh, as I always say, stay happy, stay healthy, and no matter what, keep training.